Okay, good morning, everybody. Good morning, good morning. Um, this is a follow up from our chat that we had last week on self pity. And um, there was quite a, a strong response. So I'm just wondering if there's anybody that's got any questions uh, from last week session that you would like to voice before I go into the second part of self pity. So uh, just open to the floor. If anybody has got a question that they would like to ask something that was puzzling them that was a thought an idea or something that can build us all up. Um, I'll give you a couple of seconds, maybe you hadn't thought about that. Um, Remy, I don't know if you had any thoughts from last week. We'll start with you. No, my thoughts are trying to, my thoughts are the Lord's thoughts, Meryl. So my thoughts are good. Thank you. <laughs> uh, three, four, five, six. Must I count down? Okay. All right. Okay, so let's go into screen share. Yeah. Uh, there'll be a time for uh, thoughts uh, at the end again. And uh, this time we are going to have a different kind of exercise. So what I'm going to be doing this time, I'm going to go through uh, what we have did last time, uh, not what we did, uh, follow up on what we did last time. But the difference will be that we will have a case study at the end. And then you will break into groups. And uh, in those groups, you will be asked some questions. And then we'll get together. So uh, here we go. So we are here together to go and make disciples. And that's our heart. And we are ministering to people with self-pity. And this is a follow-up session. Now, last week, we were talking about the drama triangle, where we have the person with self-pity, often as a victim. And then you often happen have a persecutor. And then you have somebody that rescues you. And the victim can feel very helpless. And uh, we can have what we call learned helplessness, which makes people feel very, very struck, stuck. So the question that we need to be thinking about when we're ministering to these people is, where do experiences of self-pity and learned helplessness usually start? And we'll go through a couple of things. And it's usually developed in childhood. And it can be very early childhood as well. Um, I don't know if you remember the, uh, ref, um, the Romanian orphans. And I'm going back now to the 1990s, 1980s where there were these orphans that were put in homes and the struggle that these children had because of neglect and how their development was very curtailed because of neglect. So early childhood is very, very often the place that this learned helplessness and self-pity can develop. So, and as I've just said it's through neglect in some way and people can often be present but not emotionally available and that is also a form of neglect or uh, it could be a single parent family and the 
uh, parent that is looking after the children is so busy trying to get uh, everything sorted, earn a job, cook meals, etc., that there can be quite a lot of neglect. And then obviously within that is abuse. And the abuse might be not necessarily um, violent. It can be spiritual abuse. It can be sexual abuse. It can be emotional abuse. So there's many very various forms of abuse. And it not necessarily from the parents. So we can have abuse from our siblings. We can be abused by other family members. And we can obviously be abused through being bullied at school. And critical parenting and criticism is also a very, very uh, important area where self-pity and uh, uh, helplessness can be learned. So uh, if the parent is, um, you uh, only you got only one star or one A in your exam, and then they criticize you, why didn't you get two? And when you get two, they criticize you again, but why you get why didn't you get three? Or uh, you're never good enough, a lot of negative words, you can do better, all that sort of thing. When it's said in the incorrect way, um, it, it's very damaging to the human psyche. And then there can be cultural structures that can, um, where we can experience self-pity. So we have many cultures that are male dominated where women are treated as inferior and that can result in a lot of learned helplessness and there's also political structures and I'm just going to refer to the uh, USSR when it was a closed regime um, and under the communist party the people that were under that regime were told what to do. It tried to make everybody equal um, and they developed a attitude of I can only do what I'm told to do and it's pointless doing anything more because it doesn't make any, it doesn't have any benefit for that. So political structures can also create a lot of self-pity and helplessness. And then there is what are the possible mental health problems that can arise from self-pity? And this list is not complete. You might have other thoughts and ideas, but it's just to remember these so that when you're working with people and people come up with these kind of thoughts and ideas of um, everything is going bad with me, nobody loves me, I'm useless. We can start thinking about uh, what is going on there. So low mood and depression, that is often a result of uh, self-pity where you have these negative thinking patterns. Uh, Self-harming, harm myself, now, I'm going to talk about self-harming a little later, but when people self-harm, it releases oxytocin and endorphins as the body wants to heal itself, and that allows you to feel good. So self-harming can be one method of trying to get released. The other is self-hatred in self-harming. And of course, there's substance abuse because I'm feeling so low and so poor. Let's have a drink and then let's have another drink or let's take some drugs to try and feel happy. So substance abuse can be rooted in all of these things that I've talked about. And then suicidal ideation, which we talked about a couple of weeks ago, where uh, we want to stop the pain, get out of the rut that we are because we are so stuck in our rut, we cannot see a way out of it. 
And then obesity. That can be also a, a very important sign of people struggling with self-pity because we are doing comfort eating, especially look for the sugars and the snacks and the chocolates and that sort of thing. It's quite uh, prevalent in that area. And then obviously negative belief systems um, and uh, perceptions. Um, I have failed, I'm useless, etc. So our negative belief symptoms can give us a lot of mental health problems. And as I said in one of my earlier talks that it is known scientifically that 75 to 98 percent of our illnesses result from the way we think. So what is the possible emotional problems that might arise from self-pity? Again, this is not an exhaustive list, but feeling trapped, feeling stuck, helpless, hopelessness, sadness. So we often find they wallow in quite a lot of um, crying and that sort of thing. And then there is the victim mentality. I am a victim. Uh, Everybody is against me. Even God is against me. Um, and uh, that can really have a, a whole lot of problems in our spiritual well-being. So what are the uh, possible behavioral problems that might arise from self-pity? Lethargy, just can't do anything. We don't get on, we just are very lethargic. Dependency, oh, yep, that's the one to watch out because very quickly when you ministering to somebody like that, they can become dependent upon you. You pray for me. You help me, that sort of thing. So dependency is something you've got to be careful of. And as you walk with somebody, there's a place where you can allow them to lean on you, but you've always got to be working with them to create a um, a, a personal agency, to be able to do things for themselves. There's a lack of motivation. What's the point? I don't know how many times you've heard that. What's the point? Complaining. Oh, it's this one's fault and it's this one and they treating me like that and nobody ever comes to visit me or that sort of type of struggle. And then there's avoidance. Avoiding dealing with the problem. Avoiding situations. Avoiding taking action. And then they can often isolate themselves. And these people will often feel very, very lonely. And that the whole world is against them and that nobody thinks about them. So the, there are quite a few behavioral problems. So here is a cartoon from Peanuts. And this is Charlie Brown speaking to Lucy. And he says, this is my depressed stance. When you're depressed, it makes a lot of difference on how you stand. The worst thing you can do is straighten up and hold your head high because then you start to feel better. If you are going to get any joy out of being depressed, you've got to stand like this. And... Uh, I hope that gives us a very good understanding that just by changing our posture, our mood can change. So what needs to be achieved? So we had the draw on a triangle and we're going to just turn this a little bit around now. So we want to allow the victim to become a thriver not just a survivor, 
but that we want to get them to a point where they can be who Jesus, who the Father created them to be, where they can fulfill what is written in their scrolls in the heavenly realms. So we, that's our aim. We want to make them a thriver. And we don't want to become a persecutor, do this, do that, but we want to challenge them and draw them out, out of their lethargy, out of their hopelessness, to create a personal agency and to walk with them as we move from where they might perceive us or others as persecutors into being challenging them to be be it to develop themselves to become, uh, become what Jesus crea created them to be. And then the last one, we need to coach them through this process. We mustn't rescue them. And, you know, just think of the coach on the side of the ground with a football team. He's not kicking the ball for them. He's saying, listen, you missed that. Try this. So you are coaching them. Um, helping them to develop themselves. So we're turning the triangle the right way up. So that's what we're trying to achieve when we are ministering to people who are struggling with self-pity. So I want to go back and give you a little bit of a reminder of some of the tools in our toolbox. Now, I'm working today specifically working with people who are born again believers of Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And so we're going to be doing uh, looking at our toolbox and the prayers that I um, shared with you earlier in the training sessions. Well, one of the prayers was cancelling the debt. That is looking at the resentments that we have. One of them was ancestral iniquity, what comes down from the previous generations. Another one is soul ties, the spiritual transference from one to another. And here we are looking specifically at the ungodly soul ties. And then there's obviously just owning, confessing. Because the scripture in 1 John 1 9, as we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And then there's cancellation of curses, curses that people have spoken over us. You no good, you hopeless, you uh, just a waste of oxygen and the curses we've spoken over ourselves. And then there's forgiveness. And remember, forgiveness is forgiveness to those uh, outside us and also forgiveness towards self. So we're going to break into our rooms. Um, Remy, I uh, presume you would have already set it up because I did warn you. But here's the case study. So you've been speaking to Bob, who is in his mid-30s. For about six months now, Bob is married and has two children. He has been passed over for promotion for the sixth time. He is tired of church, being told to stand on the word and have faith. He's slightly obese. His grandfather had post-traumatic stress disorder from the war and his dad was emotionally absent and withdrawn. So now what I'd like you to do is to go into your groups, discuss this case and say, okay, what can we do to help him in terms of prayer? You have suggested to Bob praying together and he agrees. How would you go about this? What of the prayers would you use and what is your rationale in the prayers you would you suggest? Now, I don't want you just to come up with the answer, forgive. I want to, you to think about 
who Bob needs to forgive, what does he need to forgive Bob for? So I want a, a, a ver, you to start thinking of a specific rationale why I'm going to use this prayer or prayers um, so that when we are people are brought across our path that we can start ministering to. You've got some sort of way of thinking in helping them to become who Jesus created them to be. So at this moment, I'm going to stop share. Remy, are you good to go?